Ducky couldn't make it this time. He's going to, he's going to look at it on TV tape at the science center. <laughs> uh, is Car are Carlo's lectures going to be at four for the indefinite future? Does anyone know? Or? No, okay. No, just curious. Have to get up and sit early. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> are there questions about the last lecture? Uh, yes, Kay. Well, um, well, remember when you wrote down those three Bond diagrams and you wanted to show that they added up to zero? Mm -hmm. And uh, where did you get the Bond rules? I read them off the Lagrangian because once we have things in the form of a functional integral, I'll write it just for notation. Well, it is just the scale. Phi, as I remarked in the lecture before or last, you can just read the Feynman rules off of the Lagrangian. The, propaga the propagators are read off from the quadratic part of the Lagrangian. Their i over the coefficient that occurs in the part of the Lagrangian that's quadratic in the field. And the interactions are just the interactions that appear in the Lagrangian with derivatives replaced by momentum factors. Oh. I, I, I made that point at the end of the lecture before last. Oh, do you, want, do you want to see in detail how it happens? If you'll read to me the Lagrangian, I'll show you where every part comes from. Um, I don't have it with me. At well, I'll ask you some other time, but... Um, no, that's a, are there other people who are bothered by that point who didn't see where the... Uh, well, I can see how you can separate that out into two parts. The way you did the non-interacting Lagrangian, that is... Um, Let's write down what we had. Um, Stop me if I'm making an error. I'm trying to remember what it looked like. read off from the quadratic part of the Lagrangian. Okay, that's what we're doing perturbations in. That's the Gaussian integral and the rest we're expanding in the power series. Well, it seems to me that to get the Feynman rules, you first have to rewrite that integral as one exponential operating on a second exponential as you did. The that's right, but that's, that's universal. But I don't see how you can do it when you have derivatives. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. They're variational derivatives. If I have um, delta I guess I called it definement, didn't I? Um, say this is one term that comes out from expanding the exponential. Okay, and then I have it acting on, let me say, integral d4z d4w uh, d mu phi of z, phi of z squared. <coughs> mm. Well, or just something like this, times some junk, d mu phi of w. Something like that. There may be other junk, but I'll just worry about differentiating these. Yeah, I guess the question is, how can you get it in that form? Like, it seems to me that the steps you made to get it in that form depend on the direction of argument only contains no, 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 no. Variational derivative, it doesn't matter if it's the 14th derivative. d by d phi of x of phi of y is delta, if it's in four space, four dimensional, x minus y. Okay? Okay, so whenever I uh, 
whenever I, I can I can I can compute the very I mean the variational calculus occurs for functionals termed in, in phrased in forms in terms of the functionals involving derivatives of the fields as well as functionals that don't involve any derivative of the field. And when I do a, a th when I come across a derivative, that's just going to become a power of momentum when I go into Fourier space. So you can still take L prime and uh, delta delta J out of the expression. Out of the expression when it comes to okay, it it it, 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 it just uh, just doesn't matter. Once I have shown that the functional integral gives me the right result, and then the rule for uh, for uh, analyzing it in perturbation theory for developing a perturbation theory is just the Feynman rules. And if there is a derivative occurring, then that just becomes a power of mom uh, a derivative in position space or, or, and a power of uh, momentum And when I make the Fourier transform. Okay. The, the hard point is to prove that the functional integral is what indeed gives you the right result, but that's what I proved with quotation marks around the word proved uh, at the last lecture. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you now? Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, because you would do plenty. Uh, so we have to get plenty. Um, so you have <laughs> a free field theory, and um, and you use those rules for adding those terms, even though you know there shouldn't be any. But if you figure out what that matrix A is, it's going to be one, and you're going to have to add an eta bar eta. That's right, but it doesn't matter because there's no interaction of eta bar eta with the phi field. Uh -huh. So it's just a, it's just this thing that just lies there and never it never the system falls into two decoupled parts: the ghost part, uh -huh. which and the part involving the source and the phi field. And so are you saying that it just gives you simple dashes all the Yes, it's, yes, those get all absorbed in the normalization factor. Okay. <coughs> Yes, sir. Um, I didn't understand exactly what the rule was for eliminating constraint variables. Oh. Well, there's both a, Hamil a rule in terms of Lagrangian dynamics and a rule in terms of functional integrals. In terms of Lagrangian dynamics, when you're, f well, firstly, I should say from in terms of Hamiltonian dynamics. In terms of Lagrangian dynamics, you have a bunch of, of, of dynamical variables in your theory, and you vary with respect to each one of them, and you get a bunch of Euler-Lagrange equations. And whether they involve time derivatives or not is a matter of no of total indifference from the viewpoint of Lagrangian dynamics. In order to go to a Hamiltonian form, the necessary step is to inspect all those equations of motion. And if there are some that do not involve time derivatives, the variables which they govern are called constrained variables. That is to say, in terms of the initial value problem, they are constrained. They cannot be independently specified on the initial value surface. They are given in terms of the other variables. In order to put things in Hamiltonian form, it is not good to have Lagrange equations of motion that involve constrained variables. And therefore, one must use those equations, substitute them back into the Lagrangian, and get a Lagrangian involving fewer variables. And uh, hopefully, that one hopes can be put into a form involving P's and Q's. The remark I wanted to make is that it's not explicitly necessary to satisfy, to go through that procedure, if the constrained variables have the property that determine the Lagrangian, uh, A, that they enter the Lagrangian no more than quadratically, and B, determine the Lagrangian that uh, the coefficient of the quadratic part does not involve any other fields or any other variables because then the elimination of the constrained variables is done automatically by doing the functional integral over them. OK, if the, t the functional integral will also eliminate the constrained variables if the coefficient of the quadratic term does involve the other variables. But in that case, in order to get the right answer, one needs a determinantal factor or equivalently a ghost term. OK, is that a satisfactory answer to one? When I say the coefficient of the quadratic term is a constant, of course, it may be a constant matrix if there are 42 constrained variables. Or if we're writing in function space, a constant matrix may look like a differential or integral operator in, as long as the coefficients of the various derivative terms don't involve the fields we are going to retain. Now, I use this trick to show 
that the naive Feynman rules were at the, is, are there other questions? I use this trick at the end of um, last lecture to show that the naive Feynman rules were um, valid for uh, spinner electrodynamics with a massive photon. I will not, uh, I was about to, but was constrained by pressure of time and a vast wave of hostility coming from the class up <laughs> to, <laughs> to show that it's also true for scalar electrodynamics of charged scalar particles interacting with massive photons. And um, I will now uh, finish up last lecture by demonstrating that fact and then go on to new topics. Um, the trick is, if we attempted to treat this problem canonically, we would really be in a terrible mess. We'd have all the problems associated with the derivative interactions of the scalar fields and the problems associated with the elimination of A0 from the uh, uh, vector equation of motion. They are ha problems that can be handled, but they're messy problems. So here, this is a problem complicated enough so that our functional techniques begin to pay off in that uh, we just have to write down three horrible equations instead of writing down 42 of them. The trick is the same trick as last time. I'll write the interaction, I'll write, I'll write the theory in so-called first order form. First order in this case means the uh, action involves no more than first derivatives. That's whence the notation. For uh, the electromagnetic field, I call it that even though it has a mass, we write things as before. Now, we'll play exactly the same trick for the scalar field. I will introduce as independent variables <coughs> uh, the derivatives of the scalar fields in such a way that once they are eliminated from the equations of motion, I'll introduce quantities I'll call pi mu. I guess it's plus here, yes. Phi. And finally, there's the phi psi mass term. And also, finally, there are source terms, which I won't bother to write down explicitly because I'm getting writer's cramp. Now, this is a mess, but it's a simple generalization of the trick I have done before. If you, eliminate, you look at the equations of motion for the dynamical variables f mu nu and pi mu are trivial. f mu nu is d nu a mu minus d mu a nu. That is the Euler-Lagrange equation obtained by varying f mu nu. And pi mu equals d mu plus i e a mu psi. And likewise for pi mu star, the conjugate. I won't bother to write it down. That's simply what I have hooked this up in such a way that that is what one obtains when one solves those rather trivial equations varying with respect to pi mu and pi mu star. Then when one substitutes this back in, one obtains the conventional form of the uh, Lagrangian, the one we started out with, which involves second derivatives and no trace of f mu nu and pi mu as independent dynamical variables. This process of elimination is of the sort we have discussed. It involves searching for the minima of a quadratic form. And indeed, we see that the terms quadratic and the variables to be eliminated have only constant coefficients. Thus, just as before, the integral of every over everything, d pi mu, d pi mu star, d psi, star, d psi, d a mu, I should call a lambda, it's a different index, maybe I'll call this one rho, d, d f 
sigma tau. The hardest thing is to write that down, <laughs> integrating over all variables of E v i s in first order form is equivalent to just integrating over our original variables, d psi star, d psi product over all the components of mu, d a mu, e v i s in Lagrangian form, where s in Lagrangian form is the s we've expressed only as a function of the variables displayed. However, we could do another elimination. We could choose to eliminate a different set of constrained variables. We could choose to eliminate fij pi i and pi i star. Why not? Well, first, let's see, can we do it? Oh, and also a0. Can we do it? Well, if we, we can do it by our tricks if these things enter the Lagrangian no more than quadratically, and if the coefficient of the quadratic term, the second order term, is a constant. Well, all the terms give us no possible problem, since these are quadratic, and therefore a fortiori quadratic or linear or constant in the variables we wish to eliminate. Uh, the only term that could give us a problem is this one or this one. This doesn't involve any cross terms of any kind between any of our constrained variables. It does involve uh, pi a, a0, but only multiplied by a pi 0 star, which we are not intending to eliminate. And it does involve uh, pi i, but only multiplied by a i, which we are not intending to eliminate. <laughs> so. Everything there is hunky-dory. That term is just linear in the variables we are going to eliminate. And therefore, if we are left with F0i, pi 0, pi 0 star, psi, psi star, and ai, the variables we haven't eliminated. Now, these are precisely the p's and the q's of the Hamiltonian formulation. Here is ai, which were the three independent uh, Hamiltonian position densities type variables. Here are the core conjugate momentum densities. Here are the scalar fields, and here are their conjugate momenta. Therefore, if we write the action in terms of these variables, that's what it means to write the action in Hamiltonian form, to write it as a function of the p's and q's. And therefore, the same thing up here is also equal to the integral over the remaining variables the action written in Hamiltonian form in terms of the independent variables of Hamiltonian dynamics. Now we're done, just as we were done at the corresponding stage last time. This is the Hamiltonian form of the functional integral, so it is guaranteed to give us results equivalent to canonical quantization and Dyson's formula. It is equal to this thing, which is equal to this thing. This is the form that, if true, would give us the naive Feynman rules. Therefore, the naive Feynman rules are true. Every derivative of an interaction is simply a factor of p, etc. You just read the Feynman rules off from the Lagrangian QED, the problem is solved. Okay, it goes very fast once you get the basic trick. No worries about pulling time derivatives with time ordering products, anything like that. By the dint of proving our general theorems at the last, last lecture, when we talked about j's and k's, we had to solve the problem of build, pulling a time derivative through a time-ordered product once for a free field, but that was the only time we had to solve it. For every time after that, it's going to happen automatically. This formula is going to take care of everything. Any questions about this argument? Just so people know, 
This is the completion of the arguments, and so if you are looking blank, I'll throw <laughs> <laughs> It is demonstrated. Yes, that's also quantum electrodynamics. <laughs> questions? Are there questions? This is a line of reasoning we will go through again for gauge fields. We write the functional integral in two forms obtained from each other by the most trivial of manipulations in functional integral language, although rather difficult manipulations if we were to attempt to do it in operator language one of which it manifestly gives the right generating functional because it is the Hamiltonian form. But it's terrible to try and derive Feynman rules in this language, which doesn't even look covariant. You've got pi zero and not pi i, f zero i and not f i j. The other form, which it looks nice and covariant and has nice simple Feynman rules. The two functional integrals are equal. In this form, it's easy to show as the everything is okay. And in this form, it's easy to derive Feynman rules. Now, <clears throat> this has been a rather abstract stretch, and at the end of this lecture, we'll get into an even more abstract stretch where I begin discussing gauge theories. So perhaps it's time uh, to um, do some specific computations. And I will choose to do those computations, just to give you some idea of what is going on. order computations in spinner electrodynamics with a massive photon. The theory with, of a free spinner field, a massive vector meson field, and that interaction. Um, this is a somewhat simpler theory than the scalar theory. I'll have you get at the next problem set, you'll have to do some computations in the scalar theory where you have to worry about the balance between the E squared, A mu squared interaction and the derivative interaction. Uh, the Feynman rules for this theory, we just read off. We have, of course, the spinner. I won't worry about renormalization at this stage. We'll come back and worry about that in gory detail with lots of functional integrals later. <laughs> We have the conventional Feynman propagator for the fermion, just as always. We have what we now know, what we proved at the end of last lecture, although we did the computation prematurely, is the proper propagator for the vector meson, minus i, g mu nu, minus k mu k nu, over mu squared over k squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon. And we have our fundamental vertex coming from the displayed trilinear interaction where a meson of type mu, a vector meson bearing field bearing index mu interacts with a fermion and an antifermion. It's always e to the i l in the functional integral. So that's minus i e times simply gamma mu the matrix that occurs there. Just as it was gamma 5, corresponding expression with a gamma 5 in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, spinner theory, in the theory of pseudoscalar mesons we talked about last term. Is that a mu over there when that Yes, it's a rather squiggly and scrawled mu, meaning this takes off index mu and this is mu nu or nu mu, it doesn't matter since it's symmetric. I don't have to keep that index straight like I have to keep the Fermi indices straight in here, the Dirac indices. <clears throat> now, finally, of course, we need rules for uh, initial and final states. For the spinners, we have the usual rule. I'll call the particles now electrons instead of nucleons, since this is very much like electrodynamics, except that mu is non-zero. For incoming electrons, at 
etc., just as in our previous theory. And uh, we need rules for incoming photons and outgoing photons. Um, Oh, those we got from our old, those we can read off, if you will, from our old expression for the free field. That's still good. Every photon annihilation operator has a factor of E attached to it, where E is the four vector that labels the spin state of the photon. I'll put a quote on, just so you'll know they're massive. And I remind you, E is not free, no more than U is free here, just as U must obey the free Dirac equation. So this must be transverse, so there are only three of them. It obeys the condition k dot e equals zero. And for outgoing photons, a factor of e mu star, or again, k dot e equals zero. The, uh, there is a factor in this, this set of Feynman rules at first glance will make, makes you a bit nervous about the possibility of a smooth passage to the zero mass limit because this term here looks possibly troublesome. The one over mu squared sitting out there looks like it might be bad news. In fact, this term looks like it's bad news in two ways, not only in giving us a smooth passage to the zero mass limit, but also in making this a renormalizable theory, which we still love, because it makes the propagator at high energies grow not like 1 over k squared, go not like 1 over k squared, but simply like 1 k squared over k squared at high Euclidean momenta. And that's certainly we're going to make Feynman integrals much more divergent than uh, they would be if it were simply a scalar theory. And uh, that's something we're going to have to worry about. In fact, uh, in uh, the low order computations I'll do, I'll demonstrate that this term could have been crossed out without changing anything. And then later on in a future lecture, I will give a demonstration that you can get rid of it altogether. But for the moment, it's there. It's what comes out. Hmm? You can get rid of it altogether. For this massive theory, it's not true for massive Yang Mills theories, if that's what you're worrying about. You can't get rid of it there. But for these kinds of theories, you can't. For this theory and this, it's. This. For abelian theories, you can get rid of it. For Yang Mills mesons, the situation, for non abelian gauge theories, the situation is different. There, the massless theory is not the limit of the massive theory. Okay, a simple process that I will consider is Coulomb scattering. An electron plus an electron goes into an electron plus an electron, elastic scattering of the charged fermions. The topological structure of the theory is, of course, the same as in our um, our, spin, our uh, old pseudo-scalar or scalar meson theory, and therefore to order E squared. Do not confuse E, the electron, with E, the electric charge. There are two diagrams, this one and this cross, where the wiggly line represents the photon. I'll say this has got a spinner u1 and a four momentum p1, this u2 and p2, this u1 prime and p1 prime, and this u2 prime and p2 prime labeled likewise on the lower graph. I won't bother to write those labels down explicitly. I presume you have that much sophistication. <laughs> One and two. The internal momentum here I will call k. It is, of course, equal to p1 minus p1 prime. Uh, k squared, I remind you, is what we normally call t, the invariant momentum transfers. The internal momentum here I'll call Q. It is equal to um, uh, 
P prime, well, I could write it in a hundred ways. Uh, sorry, P, P2 prime minus P1, for example, and Q squared equals U. Uh, the, um, that's the definition of T and U. Variant amplitude is the sum of the contribution of the first graph and the contribution of the second graph. The contribution of the first graph. I have a minus IE from every vertex, which is being squared. I have a minus I from the propagator, so I'll put that down. And then from the top line, I have U1 bar gamma mu U1. From the bottom line, I have U2 bar prime gamma nu U2. This is where a photon of type mu is emitted from the top line and a photon of type nu is emitted from the bottom line. And between them, there is the propagator for photon of type mu propagating and arriving as a photon of type nu to wit G mu nu minus K mu K nu over mu squared. one over k squared minus mu squared, and I don't need the i epsilon because k is always space-like. Or equivalently, instead of k squared, I'll write t. I'll shortly go to the Feynman diagram for the process of type two, but is it clear to everyone how this expression arises? <clears throat> now, let's focus attention on the apparent disaster terms with one over mu squared in them. They involve, I'll focus on one of them, k mu u1 prime gamma mu u1. From the definition of k, this is u1 bar prime, I said p1 minus p1 prime slash, right? Now, P, these are free fermions. Therefore, P slash 1 acting on U1 on the right is M times U1, and P1 prime slash acting on U1 prime on the left is M times U1. So this is U1 bar prime M minus M U1 equals 0. Therefore, in fact, the 1 over mu squared term is not present. It is absent. We will later see at a later lecture the general reason why it's always absent. But in this case, it has just come out being absent. And of course, the same thing is true for graph 2. I won't even bother. Well, let me write down what graph 1 is. A1 equals, uh, let's see, minus I squared is minus 1. That cancels this. The I goes into the other side. A1 is plus E squared. U bar prime gamma mu U1. U2 over. Ah, that wouldn't be much of a Yukawa potential over T minus mu squared. <laughs> A2 is, of course, exactly the same computation. Only the G term survives, and that's the result of the G term, except for a Fermi minus sign because I'm exchanging two particles. And I'm dividing by the cross momentum transfer square. This completes the discussion, as far as I'm going to discuss it, of Coulomb scattering in, with this, in the theory of a, with a massive photon.
Are there any questions? Notice that aside from the spin factor, it's much like the exchange of a scalar meson. And the only difference, other than matters of sign that are in fact just because of our metric convention, is that we have a gamma mu's here instead of a gamma five. Indeed, <coughs> what? U is U, the cross momentum transfer squared. And the standard Mandelstam variables, S, T, and U. In fact, this is indeed exactly as if we had exchanged four scalar mesons, one of which coupled to gamma 1, 2, 3, and gamma naught. This formula looks as if there are four kinds of photons, quote, unquote. And because of the minus sign in the metric, it also looks as one of them is very peculiar and has a negative propagator. Of course, that's an illusion. We see from this form before we did our reductions that there are only three kinds of photons, three transverse kinds of photons being exchanged. It's just that the projection operator doesn't make any difference. I'd like to talk a little bit. I could do the spin sum, but that's a trivial exercise. You will find it done in Bjorkin and Drell if you are really interested in getting d sigma d omega for Coulomb scattering. I have done enough spin sums for you, and you have for been forced to do enough spin sums in previous homework problems that I shan't bother to do this one out. Uh, but I would like to spend a few minutes. talking about the zero mass limit, which we can now take in a relatively smooth way since we've gotten rid of the 1 over mu squared in the denominator, in the, in the uh, numerator. There is first the obvious fact that the uh, forward peak and uh, backward peak, which typically occur in uh, lowest order scattering, have now moved onto the verge of the physical region. The forward peak is infinite. T equals 0 in the forward direction, and the denominator here blows up. So d sigma d omega has an infinite peak in the forward direction. Of course, this is absolutely no surprise. Exactly the same thing occurs in non-relativistic Coulomb scattering in the Rutherford formula, as you all know. And it's due to the long-range nature of the Coulomb force. There's nothing peculiarly field theoretic or gauge theory or functional integral about it just what actually happens when you scatter charged particles. Hmm. Yes? Um, why does they all find IPP cross-section? They've subtracted out Coulomb factors. That's the strong interaction part of the PP cross-section. That's called the art of making Coulomb corrections. <laughs> <laughs> And why in the actual world is it a finite cross-section? Because the proton is eventually shielded. It's sitting inside a can, it's sitting inside a can, floating around inside a can, and somewhere else on, on the surface of the can, there is negative charge to balance it. <laughs> they actually scatter electrons off, in fact, they actually scatter protons off hydrogen atoms, as you know. <laughs> they really do scatter protons off protons, and they have to work very hard to take care of the Coulomb peak. <laughs> They actually exploit it, though. They get the phase of the other amplitude because they, since they know what the Coulomb peak is exactly, they can measure the interference between the strong interaction scattering and the Coulomb peak, and thus find the phase of the strong interaction scattering from total cross-section experiments, not just its magnitude. That's right. At the ISR, they do scatter protons off protons. Now. Um, However, uh, the mass zero limit, to those of you who've had previous experience with, with quantum electrodynamics on a baby level, that is to say on the level of, of 251b last year or a similar course, looks a little strange because it looks, looking at it, as if it has the interpretation that you exchanged four photons, one of which carried and had a negative sign in its propagator. Now, this, this isn't the quantum electrodynamics you knew, learned to know and love from 251b, because in that version of quantum electrodynamics, where I quantize the theory in uh, Coulomb gauge, 
you had only two kinds of photons, the two three-dimensional transverse photons, and you had something that didn't appear to appear in this formalism at all, an instantaneous, an actual action at a distance, Coulomb interaction. Well, where does that come from? Well, it's actually in this formula. That's just another way of rewriting it and reinterpreting it by purely algebraic means. And to make life simple, so I don't have to continually write u bars and u's, I'll write j mu 1, 2 is shorthand for u bar 1 or 2 gamma mu 1 or 2. And it obeys the condition, as I've demonstrated, equals 0. In order to see the very non-relativistic looking Coulomb formulation, I'll have to separate this out into space and time parts. And therefore, I'll write this as k0, j0, minus space part of k plus space part of j, 1, 2, equals 0. I'll likewise write the Feynman amplitude, just A1. The same reasoning would apply to A2. And I'll leave you to check that if you don't believe me. E squared, J01, J01 minus, uh, sorry, J02, J1 dot J2 over, now the mass is 0. So I just have k0 squared minus k squared. Is there any question about what I have done to write this form in the mu squared equals 0 limit? I've just replaced t by k squared and set mu squared equal to 0. Oh, get rid of one of the bars and replace it with a prime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the fact that that's there. Um, now, to, uh, le to go further, I will have to separate J into its spatially transverse and its spatially <coughs> longitudinal part. I'll write J, R is 1 or 2, as J transverse R minus K, K dot jr over the 3 part of k squared. j transverse is transverse to k by construction. The same thing could also be written using the equation above as j transverse r minus k k0 j0r over k squared using the current conservation equation. Now we're ready to go. This is e squared. Firstly, let's get the transverse part. j transverse with j transverse. That's minus j transverse dot j transverse over k0 squared minus k squared. This part is interpretable as the exchange of two transverse photons. There's the typical massless photon propagator, 1 over k0 squared minus k squared. There's just the interaction between the transverse parts of the currents. So they're only interacting with two kinds of photons because there are only two components to it, two independent components to a transverse vector field. Notice the appropriate sign change has taken place. I told you it was this there because of our metric. So it does look like the exchange of particles with a normal propagator. It's the same sign as you would get if you exchanged a scalar particle. And I should say this is 1 and this is 2. Now, of course, that's trivial. What about the other parts, which are going to involve j01 and j02? Well, here we're going to have a mess, so I better write it down. There's from the first term that's there explicitly, 1 over k0 squared minus k squared. 
And then from the cross term of this term with his partner on the other side, I will obtain plus vector k squared, k0 squared, over vector k to the fourth. Any questions about that? That's algebra. Now, of course, a certain simplification occurs. And in fact, we can combine denominators. And write. this thing as a second term e squared j01 j02 um, let's see I have a common denominator which is vector k squared k squared, k0 squared minus k squared. The numerator on one side, I have k squared. The numerator on the other side, I have, oops. What? No, 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 It's minus j dot j up here, so there's a minus sign in here. Sorry. <laughs> k vector squared minus k0 squared. <laughs> that came from minus j dot j. <laughs> and uh, uh, therefore, which is, of course, this term cancels this one, and I get a minus sign in front. Now, please notice the peculiar form of this expression. It has no k naught in the denominator. It is just 1 over vector k squared. That is to say, it does not correspond to a retarded interaction, an inter time dependent interaction, which would have k naught in its Fourier transform, but to an instantaneous interaction. And indeed, to that instantaneous interaction, which is the Fourier transform of 1 over vector k squared, i.e., the Coulomb interaction between the currents. <coughs> Thus, this expression, the self-same expression, which looks in one way as if it is corresponds to the exchange of four kinds of photons, one of which with a funny sign in it, is absolutely equivalent to an expression that would correspond to the exchange of merely two transverse photons and an instantaneous Coulomb interaction between the charge densities between the components of J0. For those of you who like to play with signs, I leave it as an exercise to you to compare this and show that the Coulomb interaction is repulsive if J01 and J02 have the same signs and attractive if J01 and J02 have opposite signs. I shan't bother to go through that here. Are there any questions about what I have done? Everyone follows every step in the algebra, which is you know, really trivial. It's not like these funny functional integral things and the, and the interpretation afterward. Uh, of course, uh, we've only been playing with low order diagrams, and if we want to show uh, similar things are true in general, we're either have, going to have to crank up an enormous amount of combinatoric machinery or get to some general formalism that enables us to short circuit the combinatoric machinery, i.e. functional integration. And I will do that in a subsequent lecture, but I thought it was nice to let you see how these things work out in particular diagrams before giving you a general argument. Now, uh, the next process I would like to discuss, although I will not discuss it nearly like as much as the same completeness. Again, if you want a complete discussion, you can see Bjorkane and Drell.
is Compton scattering. That is to see E plus gamma goes into E plus gamma. Aside from the extra indices, this is just the same sort of thing as the meson nucleon scattering we discussed in our scalar theory, and therefore there are two diagrams of the same topological structure. This and this cross. <clears throat> I'll call this U and P. This is a photon. I have to say what photon it is. It's the photon labeled by, polar, by uh, the four vector E. This is E prime and K prime. And this is U prime and P prime. <clears throat> Um, let me see how I decided to do it. Yes. The, fine, the uh, same labeling, of course, is not true for the second diagram. The invariant Feynman amplitude, Ia. I is always there, so the optical theorem will involve eventually the imaginary part rather than the real part. Ia is, can, we can just write down, running along the line in the first term up here. U bar prime, well, first let's accumulate our i's, I'm sorry. There's a minus i e squared from the two interactions and an i from the propagator. U bar prime, gamma mu, there's an interaction. It's connected to an outgoing photon, so that's e prime mu star. There's the propagator. I've already accumulated the i in the denominator. The internal momentum is p plus k. Again, the i epsilon is not necessary because the pole is not in the physical region. Gamma lambda. U lambda, that's the absorption of that photon. And the u plus dot, dot, dot. I wrote it out with the indices, so you'll see where it comes from. But can simplify somewhat, minus e squared, u bar prime, e slash, 1 over p slash. No. It's just my habit to gather up all the i's at once so I don't have to remember the put. You may use another habit. This is not a recommended prescription. e prime slash star e slash u. The other diagram is, of course, almost the same thing, except the first thing that happens as we go from left to right is the absorption of the initial photon. The momentum in the denominator is somewhat different. It's p prime minus k plus m minus m, excuse me on antiparticle. Here comes the e prime slash star. And here is the u. Of course, this expression can be considerably simplified by rationalizing the denominators, commuting things about, using the fact that the u's and the u bars obey the free equations, etc. I shall not bore you with that. If you are interested, again, you can find it all worked out in Bjorkin and Drell, Volume 1. It's a standard computation. Again, I would like to focus on the zero mass limit, though, and to find some and establish some interesting properties of this thing as the photon mass goes to zero. You recall, I will give you a memory of previous lecture, the last lecture, of, indeed the very last part of the last lecture of last semester. <coughs> we consider the emission or absorption of a photon by a, um, by a external current distribution. The amplitude for emission of a single photon was e mu star j mu twiddle of k, while there were some kinematic factors. <clears throat> we knew because the external current was conserved that k mu 
j mu of k equals zero. Now, we also studied one particular helicity state of the three helicity states allowed for the photon. And by pure kinematic reasoning, we showed that for helicity zero, E mu equals K mu over mu plus order mu over K naught. That was a straightforward computation, which I hope you remember, just pure kinematics. From which it followed that the amplitude for the emission of helicity zero was order mu over k naught and went to zero as mu went to zero. Does everyone remember that argument? I've sketched out the essential steps in it. Now, the um, point I want to investigate is first in uh, general and then in this particular, oh, sorry. The point of this exercise was to demonstrate how a helicity theory of a photon with three, a massive photon with three helicity states smoothly went over to this theory of a massless photon with two helicity states as the mass went to zero. Of course, I have to say went to zero with respect to what? It's certainly not true for a particle at rest. It went to zero with respect to the moment energy of the particle. <laughs> no. <laughs> the uh, question is, is a corresponding thing true in our more complicated theory full of interactions? Obviously, the key equation is the analog of this one that I've put a box around. Well, how do we compute the amplitude for emission or absorption of a photon in a fully interacting field theory? We know how to compute that scattering amplitude in the general theory. We do it via the reduction formula. We reduce and reduce and reduce. And let me imagine I have reduced everything until only the last gamma is left unreduced. And then the reduction formula will tell me that the amplitude is proportional to, though of course be an emu star for that gamma. That's that gamma. <coughs> a factor of del squared plus mu squared to take care of the pole and the propagator, as always. The state A, the uh, un single unreduced field, A mu of x, and the state B. Oops, sorry, exactly wrong, B, A. The time ordering symbol is unnecessary, although in general it appears in the reduction formula because we have reduced everything but one field. If we're taking serious account of renormalization, this should be a renormalized field that has an amplitude one for making a photon, but I'll just absorb that in the proportionality sign. Now, the um, point is that a Heisen, one of, these are the exact Heisenberg fields, I remind you. That's what appears in the reduction formula, and these are the exact physical states. I point out to you that one of our Heisenberg equations of motion is d mu a mu equals zero. That came from the conservation by differentiating the photon Euler Lagrange equation using the fact that the current is conserved. Therefore, this matrix element, d mu commutes with del squared plus mu squared, Therefore, is precisely the same statement, written in position space rather than momentum space, that we have used here in our earlier argument to indicate, to prove the suppression of helicity zero photons. And therefore, this argument for the suppression of helicity zero photons as the mass goes to zero should be as true in the full field theory as it was in the theory with the static source. With not a static source, with a C number source. 
Are there any questions about this argument? Now, <clears throat> it's always, and general arguments are always nice, but one sleeps better at night if one has made particular checks in simple cases. So just to make sure nothing is going wrong, let me uh, attempt to um, to check this formula. Well, not this part, which is just pure kinematics, which this would be dull and boring to check that, but the part that came you should go to zero, zero when k, it should vanish exactly when e mu is proportional to k mu. So let's check. Or equivalently, when e star e prime equals k prime. That's equivalent to checking this conservation equation. Now, I just took E rather than E prime out of, to confuse you. I start that one. Okay, so what I want to check, to check the conservation equation, which would be, the conservation equation, of course, is exact when mu equals zero or not. The suppression of the helicity zero states is a consequence of it in elementary kinematics as mu goes to zero. I'll just take this expression and plug in E equals K and see uh, if the thing vanishes or doesn't. Well, we notice in the first term we have an E slash acting on a U, which is a K slash acting on a U, which of course could be written as P slash plus K slash minus M acting on U, because P slash minus M on U is zero. Likewise, in the second term, we have a U bar prime with an E slash, which is a U bar prime with a K slash, which is uh, minus P, slash, P prime slash plus K slash plus M. Whoops, sorry, and a U bar prime here. I've added these extra factors to cancel the Feynman denominators. Thus we find that the full term is A equals minus E squared from the first term, U bar prime, E prime star slash U, and from the second term, minus, because this is minus the Feynman denominator, That checks that the amplitude strictly vanishes for any mass when E equals K, and therefore vanishes for helicity zero states when mu goes to zero. Any questions? Please notice, just because we have proved something is true in general, this does not mean it is true Feynman diagram for Feynman diagram. When you know something is true in general for all values of E, it is true, of course, for all the derivatives with respect to E at E equals zero. That is to say, for all orders of perturbation theory. However, all, each order of perturbation theory is a sum of Feynman diagrams. And it just means that it must be true for that whole sum. It does not mean it must be true for the individual diagrams. And indeed, you see in this case, it is, we have to take account of both diagrams to get the proper cancellation. In this case, of course, the diagram, unlike the previous case, the diagrams were just an example. We have a completely rigorous and general argument sitting on the right-hand board. We don't have to go through a complicated combinatorics associated with the diagrams of order E fourth, E six, et cetera, to prove the theorem. Are there any questions? 
No, this is for non-zero mass. D mu A mu E, we don't even know what the Heisenberg equations of motion are. No, th sorry. This first is an argument for non-zero mass. The exact equation which is true is that K mu on the, if E is set equal to K, the amplitude vanishes. That's true even if the mass is a gram. Okay. The second part of the argument is that for a longitude, for a helicity zero state, E mu equals K mu over the mass plus order mass over K naught. That's just kinematics. You write down the, the properly normalized uh, helicity zero thing. This thing dotted into, this thing gives zero, and this thing gives something proportional to the mass over the energy. That we did last semester. Okay. The old, therefore, the only part of the argument that has to be checked that in any way can be different in the interacting, in the, in the full field theory, is the statement that when k e equals k, the amplitude vanishes. I've given a general proof on this board, and I've checked it in a particular instance here. Okay. All the rest of it is, doesn't matter where, how, where that amplitude came from as long as it obeys this condition that k dotted into it is zero. Okay. Now, before I depart from specific Feynman calculations, I would like to make a few few comments on um, summing. over photon spins. The amplitude for emitting a photon in a particular spin state will be, of course, the polarization vector for that spin state, if it's, let's say it's in the final state, so that's starred, uh, times uh, some four vector, which I'll call a mu. We typically like to do a spin sum over final states. We can't measure the polarization of our final vector mesons. That is to say, we'd like to get the sum on r equals 1 to 3 of the absolute value of a squared equals sum on r a mu e mu r e nu r star a nu. Now this is sum on r which we know from last semester when I discussed the free field. This equals a mu minus g mu nu plus k mu k nu over mu squared a nu. This is the projection operator on the three transverse, four-dimensionally transverse vectors. Just as in the pre similar formula for summing over spinners, we had p slash plus m, the projection operator on the positive energy spinners. This sum is, in fact, considerably easier than the spinner sum because by the arguments I have just given, in any case, k nu a nu equals 0. Therefore, this term vanishes, and the sum becomes very trivial. It is simply minus a mu, a mu, which is a nice, neat thing to know. It makes doing vector spin sums considerably easier than doing spinner spin sums, because you don't have the analog of all those ugly extra gamma matrices to commute around. Likewise, uh, for averaging, this is true either when the mass is large or when the mass is small. It doesn't matter. When the mass is small, you may say I only want to sum over two spin states. But if you're only summing over two spin states, you might as well sum over three because I've just shown the amplitude for emitting the third is negligible. <laughs> yes? Um, why isn't it A star mu? It is A star mu. I simply, you're quite correct. Thank you. Other corrections or questions? A 
Likewise, for averaging over initial spins, if one has an unpolarized beam and you wish to average over initial spins, that's, of course, the same sort of th sum times one-third because there are three photon states. If mu is not equal to zero, or I should say if mu is much greater than k naught, since it is a continuous transition, if, but times only times one-half, if mu is equal to zero, or if mu is much less than k naught, because if mu is much less than k naught, if the mass of a photon is, for example, if the photon Compton wavelengths is, for example, the experimental uh, lower bound, 10,000 kilometers, then even the most imperfect light bulb will not emit all three helicity states with indifference. It will, in fact, emit no longitudinally polarized, no, uh, no helicity zero photons, and therefore, we may think it's an unpolarized beam, but really it's only a random mixture of two degrees of polarization, not of three, and would, would, one would make an error by inserting a one-third. What does that mean in language greater than one? The mass of the photon, whoops, I wrote it backwards, didn't oh. yeah, no. yeah, no. yeah, comparable to or greater than. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. You on the you on the order of k naught, right? Because mu much greater than k naught is an impossibility by the conservation of energy. K naught begins at mu. That is to say, in practical instances, of course, we don't have to worry about intermediate range of masses. We're either talking about things like rho mesons, which unquestionably, if they are unpolarized, have three degrees of polarization, or things like photons, which for all practical purposes have two, regardless of whether they're really massless or only have a mass of uh, 10 to the minus 30th times the electron mass or whatever. <laughs> um, now, this concludes a little part of the lecture that almost everyone can understand. <laughs> and we are now, we're now going to begin. We're going to go back to the wonderland of functional integrals, where I adopt the lecturing style of the Delphic Oracle. <laughs> you know, <how> to <laughs> I do without breathing laurel, breathing natural gas either. It's all done with cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Ordinary cigarettes. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> I once read a trap bought in Greece a trap many years ago. It has democratic government then. Uh, I read <laughs> by Western bourgeois standards, and I read a travel guide that said, uh, "Delphi, here is where the oracle used to eat." laurel leaves and breathe natural gas and fall into a rupture. <laughs> I believe the first recorded instance of uh, physical damage to the consciousness altering drugs, but <laughs> I digress, I digress. Anyway. We, um, we are now going to begin a discussion, which will be con uh, continued next lecture, of course, of massless electrodynamics. Not as we have been thinking of it until now, as the limit of the mass of theory as the mass goes to zero, but uh, sui generis as an object by itself, which is a Lagrangian, which we have to confront without embedding it in some other family of Lagrangians and try to quantize it. I'll just write down the Lagrangian. Well, now no mass term, and let's say it's the spinner, a charged spinner that we are dealing with. 
and perhaps source terms. Now, <clears throat> um, this uh, theory uh, cannot be directly quantized canonically by naive methods. I discussed that at the end of last semester. If one attempts to, uh, one cannot eliminate A0, then the mass is zero, and uh, the whole canonical quantization program uh, falls apart. That's because this is a theory with gauge invariance, as I emphasized at the end of last semester, but that was around a month ago, so maybe I'd better say it over again. Gauge transformations are not like ordinary internal symmetries. They are not transformations that turn two physically distinguishable objects, uh, one physical situation into another distinguishable physical situation with an identical scattering amplitude, like isospin transformations turn a proton into a neutron. They are situation, they are simply represent changes of description of the theory rather than actual changes of the state. That is to say, more conventional transformations can be sensibly interpreted both actively as changing the state or passively as changing your description. But a gauge transformation is only sensibly interpreted in the passive sense. It is a change of description. As I to repeat a joke that went over well when I last made it, you never read an experimental paper on electrodynamic effects where there's a footnote that says this experiment was done in Coulomb gauge. Now, it doesn't have last well, I see. That much, <laughs> that much, that much, that much of the lecture you remembered, yes. <laughs> still tell there were two kinds of particles. For example, um, assuming there was, you had some external force that attracted a proton and neutron equally, you could observe, for example, you might think if you were experimenting, if a single proton came through the room, you couldn't tell it wasn't a single neutron. On the other hand, if you tried to put them in energy levels about some attractive center, you would discover you could put one proton, assuming a spin-dependent force for simplicity, you could put one proton in, one of these X particles in, and then you could put a second one in, but only some of them, okay? If a neutron happened to come through the window, then you could drop that in your energy level, and it would fall into the same energy level. However, if a proton dropped through, came through the window, you wouldn't be able to fit it in. Hmm? Hmm? You make the same argument counting states using the, <laughs> using the Bose factor. You could put more in. If you, if they, you had two different kinds, you could put... Um, Okay, you could, you could build many states, and the other way you could choose fewer states. So yes, you could tell that there were different kinds of particles, and you could tell that you really had two kinds of particles, and their interactions were symmetric, and you could experimentally deduce isospin invariance. Okay, if, if the two particles were one to one, I... Uh, the, deal, the way of seeing that is that this is not the situation with isospin. It is the situation with electric charge. The only observables we can measure, forget about electrodynamics, suppose we just had a charge conserving theory like the theory of neutrons of strong interactions. The only observables we can measure and the only experimental apparatus we have is charge zero apparatus and charge zero observables. Okay, everything we can measure is, is electrically neutral, right? We manipulate things with electric fields and magnetic fields and uh, we, uh, there's no box that spits out positively charged particles in one direction without spitting out negatively charged particles in the other direction. Nevertheless, we have absolutely no problem experimentally determining electric charge invariance. Okay. Gauge transformations are different. Now, <clears throat> Therefore, in order to canonically quantize the theory, you have to pick a gauge. You have to, there is some, if you, there is, you do not never have a well-defined initial value problem if you don't write down some condition that tells you what gauge you are looking in. Because again, as I said last lecture, no matter how many derivatives of the fields you give on the initial value surface, you can always make a gauge transformation, that is the identity, in some neighborhood of the initial value surface and non not the identity at some future time. Therefore, you must adopt a condition that firmly and forever fixes your gauge, like the Coulomb gauge condition, divergence of A equals zero, 
And then you have eliminated, by convention and fiat, the gauge degrees of freedom. And then you have a well-defined initial value problem. And if you are lucky and witty in your choice of gauge, you can then could do the uh, witting, I should say, in your choice of gauge. Then you can uh, uh, go through the entire, crank out the entire canonical machinery, eliminate constrained variables, impose canonical commutation rules, and run, be able to compute everything. Um, if you, of course, um, one hopes that your choice of gauge doesn't matter. Uh, as far as actually observable quantities go, i.e. gauge invariant measurements. If I like Coulomb gauge and somebody else likes Blotz gauge, when he is Mr. Blotz, he's just invented it, then uh, the computations may be simpler or more difficult in one gauge as opposed to another, but the final answer should be the same. But at the moment, the statement represents an act of faith. It's hopeful, hope that this gauge invariance property of the classical theory I'm about to quantize will carry over at least that much into the canonically quantized theory, but that's something that remains to be shown. That's the, um, we will show it. We'll show it in the next lecture. Uh, this, um, that's the canonical viewpoint on um, uh, uh, quantization of theories with uh, with gauge invariance as expressed by Fermi and Dirac back around 1929-1930. Now, uh, we could also take a functional integral viewpoint. I have not been thinking of the functional integral as a primary object, but as something we derive from canonical quantization. But maybe there is uh, some young Turk, or there may actually be actual Turks in the audience. Well, that's not. Well, they were, the actual young Turks were rather nasty. They wanted to sell out to the Germans. There may be some young rebel in the audience who says, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, no, it was the Allied powers. It was the, that's right, that's right. They wanted to see Turkey to the Allied powers, forgive me. And then, add, well, no time for Turkish history. The, the, uh, the, um, the uh, might say, let's take functional integration as primary and forget about canonical quantization. We just have these magic formulas. Let's uh, just apply them. And of course, if they attempted to apply them in this case, they would run into trouble. We have, as usual, we would attempt to divide the, uh, find the, um, Feynman propagator by inverting the quadratic form in Lagrangian. As usual, we would break things up into a transverse and a longitudinal projection operator. Only the transverse part of the field enters into this because it's the anti-symmetric derivative. So I would get minus i over k squared from here. And the longitudinal part doesn't enter at all into the quadratic part of the Lagrangian. So I would get 1 over 0, <laughs> attempting to invert the part, quadratic part of the action involving the longitudinal part of the field. And that is obvious, disastrous garbage. I can't do any computations with that propagator. Now, a few years ago, Fadeyev and Popov um, looked at this problem from the functional integral viewpoint. They were young Russians, and they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they uh, made a guess about what to do. And uh, that guess, they were later able to verify with canonical quantization. However, in order to explain uh, what their guess was to you, in fact, I'll explain it at the beginning of next lecture, I would... Um, I'll have to tell you a little bit more about Feynman's original formulation of uh, functional integrals and give a little digression. This is just a little historical note. When Feynman originally formulated functional integration, path integration he called it, or the sum over histories, the Feynman sum over histories, he didn't do it in terms of a source formalism, as we've been doing it, where you compute generating functions. He wanted to compute actual transition matrix elements. I'll write down his formula. I won't prove it, although it could be proved by pretty much the same techniques we've been using. 
uh, in the simplest case, of a particle and a potential. A V of Q, let me call it. Feynman established the following formula. He wanted to compute the transition amplitude from, t from a state where the particle was at position Q1 at time T1 into a state where it was at position Q2 at time T2. And he was able to show that this could be written as a functional integral LDT, where the integration doesn't go over arbitrary functions over the range T1 and T2, but is restricted to run over functions that are held fixed at the endpoints, just as in the ha uh, Hamilton's principle, Hamilton's formulation of Lagrangian mechanics. Now, um, Uh, Feynman described this as a sum over histories. He said this was a unique formulation of quantum mechanics, as indeed it was, in which we imagine the particle goes over all cl possible classical paths from the desired initial state to the desired final state. And then we sum. The functional integral gives a precise meaning to the concept of summation. E to the i times the action over all possible paths. And then we get the transition matrix element. Now, we can see, if we allow L to have source terms, how this uh, becomes our formulation if we let T1 and T2 go to infinity. Or more precisely, we let T1 to go to plus and minus and minus and plus infinity, respectively. <coughs> if we kept the Qs at the endpoints fixed, we would get the transition matrix element from some initial state Q1 and to some final state Q2 over an infinite stretch of time. We aren't keeping the endpoints fixed, but that doesn't matter because our discussion last semester of how Dyson's formula gave us the S matrix element uh, included an argument that uh, as we go down along to f and for field theories, as we go to the far past and the far future, only the gro no matter what state you have on the right and what state you have on the left, all that survives is a vacuum vacuum transition. All the other parts are canceled by contributions of oscillating phases. So uh, we could do it with this particular Q1 or a Q2, and we'd get vacuum to vacuum aside from some normalization factor. Or we could just let Q1 and Q2 be free, integrate over all possible Q1s and all possible Q2s, and we'd then just change the normalization factor. So our form comes from Feynman's form. In fact, it's even better. Because we always really do, although I never bothered to explicitly do it on the board, except I did it once, we really do our integrals in Euclidean space. And there, the non-vacuum states are not canceled by any fancy riemann lebesgue argument, but just by a flat decreasing exponential, <laughs> which surely knocks them out, knocks them out even more forcefully. A uh, second thing we can see from this formulation that's a bit not obvious, that's not as obvious from our formulation. As is to um, why uh, the classical mechanics is important in the small h bar limit. Because from Feynman's principle written down here, one can see where Hamilton's principle comes from if one restores the h bar, which we've been setting equal to 1. h bar has the dimensions of action, the first thing people learned. And therefore, if we have h bar set equal, not equal to 1, this must be 1 over h bar. So we have the exponential of a dimensionless number. Now as h bar goes to 0, uh, this becomes, this is some phase factor, and it becomes a rapidly oscillating phase factor, more and more rapidly oscillating as h bar gets smaller and smaller. Now, we all know what to do with rapidly oscillating integrals. They are dominated by points of stationary phase. <laughs> Functional integral dominated by stationary phase points.
What are stationary phase points? They're the points where the phase is stationary when you vary the integration variable. The phase is the action. The integration variable is Q. And we must vary it sticking to Feynman's boundary conditions. This is nothing but Hamilton's principle that picks out the classical motions. The reason classical motions are important in the small h-bar limit, according to Feynman, is because of the principle of stationary phase. They are the points where the action, which is the phase, is stationary. Well, that's nice, but it's taken us uh, a few minutes over time, and it's also taken us away from the problems of gauge theories. But I can now explain the idea of Fadiev and Popov, which next lecture I will impl firstly implement in equations, secondly apply, and thirdly justify by recourse to canonical quantization. Fadiev and Popov's central idea is that you're doing something very dumb if you put this thing in the functional integral. Because Feynman, who in this way of looking at things is, the is elevated to the status of God, <laughs> said, sum over histories. Now, if you have a gauge theory, the same history, exactly the same motion of for all observable quantities, may be represented by a billion, in fact, an infinite number, of different analytic, func different analytic functions of the fields as a function of space and time, all connected to each other by a gauge transformation. So you're not summing over the histories in the right way. That is to say, if you just stuck this thing in a functional integral and tried to do the functional integral, you'd be summing over histories many, many times for each history. No wonder, Fadiev and Popov said, that you get infinity if you attempt to evaluate the integral. You get infinity because you're summing over each history an infinite number of times. That's where the 1 over 0 comes from, and that's where the infinity comes from. Therefore, you must change the functional integral formula, Russian dogma, the common turn line. You must change the functional integral formula so that you sum over each history only once, not once over it in one gauge, and once over it in another gauge, and once over it in yet another gauge, but once and only once. Now, how do we arrange the functional integral? How do we fix up our formula so we sum over each history only once? Well, it involves something like putting in a delta function, and what I mean more precisely by that, I will explain next lecture. <laughs> <laughs>